This debate has been taking place across the country, not just in the DIFC, both at federal and local level. People are basically realizing that the, the current defined benefit scheme is not working. And instead of shying away from the really complex and sensitive issues involved, it was imperative that the DIFC, as the leading and, and most dynamic financial hub in the country, steps up to play a leading role in this project. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, warm welcome from all of us at the DIFC. And once again, thank you for taking the time to attend today's proceedings. As always, we greatly appreciate your support. Uh, and on a side note, isn't the weather outside marvelous for the end of April? <laughs> well, <coughs> the amount of people in attendance today and the interest that has been generated overall in the DIFC, in the press and elsewhere, are also indicative uh, of the immense importance uh, of the topic of today's discussion. We are indeed looking at a better way forward regarding the matter of workplace savings in the DIFC. In replacement of the end of service gratuity scheme that's been with us since the inception of the DIFC uh, and before that pretty much what has been in place for many years in the, in, in the UAE. I think what's important to note uh, in terms of what we'll be proposing to you today is that it is the culmination of three years efforts. This, this is not something that, that came up overnight. So um, let's just start and have a quick look at the uh, agenda for today's proceedings and the, and the speakers that will hopefully enlighten you uh, on the topic under discussion. And first of all, I will be providing you uh, with a bit of background as how, how this exercise fits into the objectives of the DIFC, after which Mr. Philip Wheeler from Ernest & Young will give you an overview on global trends and best practice in terms of retirement savings, as well as leading you through the key conclusions of the working group and the proposed next steps. Uh, Dr. Chris Payne from DIFC Group Strategy will then provide you with the details of the recent survey that has been conducted amongst employers in the DIFC on this topic. And by the way, thank you for your participation, which was very helpful. Chris will also discuss with you some of the common queries that emanated uh, from the survey. And as you can see from the short bios there of these two gentlemen, both are experts in their field and their involvement in this exercise have been substantial and of great value. Um, these proceedings will then be followed by a Q&A session. Now we have an hour and a half uh, for today's session and if need be we will set aside uh, more time either today or sometime in the future. But we do want to spend the material portion of today's proceedings in answering your questions. I think that's, that's one of the most important things. Um, if indeed you need our help in this regard, I've also prepared a list to help you on your way, but I don't think that will be necessary. Also, just a note on, on the conduct of proceedings. Uh, I, I would suggest that we get the, the, the presentations out of the way and you keep your questions to the end. And once the presentations are finished, all three of us will then gather on the stage here and then we will try, hopefully in an orderly fashion, uh, to answer as, as many of your questions as possible. However, it's imperative to note that what we are doing today is still part uh, uh, an, uh, of a process of outreach and gaining as much feedback as possible from you before any final decisions are made. We may therefore not be able to answer all of your questions, but we will surely try and take to heart any lessons learnt from the matters raised today. So let's see how this 
project fits in uh, with the DIFC's objectives as a leading financial center. We at the DIFC are constantly assessing on how to do things better and to implement required changes in a manner that best serves you, our center establishments, and its employees, which we regard as our greatest assets. It also means within the context of our vision, uh, driving the future of finance and our mission to be the world's most advanced financial center, that we should push the limits in a way that a city like Dubai and the vision of its leaders demand of us. And when doing so, we should not stray from our core values of integrity, transparency, and efficiency. It is also in this context that certain key questions arose in respect of the end of service gratuity scheme over the past few years. This debate has been taking place across the country, not just in the DIFC, both at federal and local level. People are basically realizing that the, the current defined benefit scheme is not working. And instead of shying away from the really complex and sensitive issues involved, it was imperative that the DIFC, as the leading and, and most dynamic financial hub in the country, steps up to play a leading role in this project, also in line with, with those objects. Consequently, the governor of the DIFC uh, constitute a working group in 2016. And we have been steadfastly working on our brief ever since. And th that brief was to consider whether our end of service gratuity scheme is still fit for purpose for a global financial hub in line with those core values as stated. Three reports have been produced uh, by the working group in two phases. Uh, in, in terms of the work that's been conducted thus far. Now these reports are available for your consideration if you were interested in the details of the working group's findings and its recommendations, but I have to warn you, they're quite voluminous. Now phase one of the project was primarily focused on the understanding whether there was indeed appetite, both at employer level and at governmental level, for any change in this regard. And if you think about it carefully, what we are doing here is essentially looking you know, at changing the social contract for expat work workers in the UAE, pretty much changed by, fueled by changes in demographics, as Phil will, will explain later, and global trends. Now this work was done by employer surveys in the DIFC, doing a full situation analysis, and considering the interests of all stakeholders in the DIFC, looking at the key risks and advantages of the schemes globally available in, in this context. And the initial findings at the end of 2016 uh, led to the higher board, chaired by His Highness the President, approving in principle a new way forward in this regard. And this led to phase two uh, of the working group's activities, which has been taking place over the past two years. Now phase two uh, was itself uh, divided into two stages. In stage one, which is essentially just focusing on the high-level design components and requirements, and then stage two was looking specifically at designing the proposed solution. And the recommendations in those regards were approved by the higher board at the end of 2018, and which paved the way for phase three, which we are basically standing at now, which is going towards implementation. The first three months of this year were spent conceptually refining the offering, talking with industry experts and also with a team of specialist barristers in the UK to the point of what is presented to you here today. Now it's very important to note that all this work was done on a very inclusive basis in the context of the working group methodology, uh, project managed by EY, EY uh, for most of the way. And it involved centre establishments, industry professionals, service providers in this space, expert consultants, and also by doing surveys, benchmark analyses, and a number of consultations. And I think also most importantly, with the DFSA being involved and keeping an eye along the way. Also given uh, the amount of interest in this, uh, and, and the importance of this project, 
a fair amount of discussion has also taken place with local and federal government departments and agencies over the past three years. My personal view is that we can be very proud of what has been achieved by the working group thus far, but it is, of course, subject to your acceptance and participation in the scheme, which is paramount and which is why we are essentially here today. And on that note, I would like to invite Mr. Philip Wheeler from Ernest & Young to the stage. As previously pointed out in his bio, Phil uh, is a pensions actuary with more than 25 years of relevant experience. He's been a member of the working group since 2016 and was pretty much at the coal face of the project management of this project uh, since then. So, thank you. Morning, everyone. My name's Philip Wheeler, as mentioned. It's a lovely day, but I'm a bit hot, so apologies. As Jacques mentioned, I've supported the working group for the last two and a half years, uh, and also supported the latest phase of development. In terms of the global trends and best practice that we see around the globe, there's a strong case for at least considering reform of the end-of-service gratuity system, which is where the whole working group came from. And when we looked at this in detail, there are four particular trends to take note here. The first one is people are remaining for longer. Expatriates aren't coming over for a two, three, four year stint anymore. They're staying here for a good nine, ten years now. And that comes through from the original survey and indeed the latest survey that we consulted with you in the last few weeks. Now if you're staying here for longer, then there's going to be a desire to be able to make more long-term plans. And that includes making long-term savings plans. So it's making sure that within this community there is some kind of environment that allows employees to be able to save in a robust, controlled, careful, efficient manner. The second one is the way in which the centre attracts new talent to the region. In the olden days, 10, 15 years ago, it was not unusual to see a salary increase to attract people which was 50, 100% above their home country salary. And if you were lucky enough to be able to achieve that, all well and good, because you didn't really mind about the other benefits that you might not be bringing across. But the trend that we're seeing at the moment is very much towards salary equivalents on regular cash items. So if you're seeing that kind of equivalence come through, then the next question to attract someone is, well, what about irregular cash and non-cash benefits? How are those being addressed? And so there needs to be a good answer to be able to explain what is on offer there. And the existing end of service gratuity by virtue of being defined benefit is a difficult one to quantify compared to alternatives. And, and the pace of this change is very fast. The whole region, and in particular the UAE, the pace of change is phenomenal compared to what you see in the rest of the world. So if you're going to make a policy change, you need to make it sooner rather than later if you're to remain competitive on a global stage. When we look at overall global trends, though, and this is 25 years of experience because when I first started work, I was actually overseeing work converting defined benefit arrangements to defined contribution. Um, I've done the other way as well, I would add. It's very much the case that the world is seeing a trend towards defined contribution saving. And there are some very good reasons why that takes place. It provides benefit security away from the finances of the employer. It also relieves employers from an open-ended liability. If someone is going to leave in five years' time, what is the eventual cost going to be? Well, okay, you guess that it's five years when they might leave, but what salary might they be on? And it could be just a one-off payment, which is um, cash flow-wise sometimes difficult to achieve when uh, liquidity might be low which also links into funding. In order to provide a degree of um, benefit security to employees, you have to fund benefits. And in one context, 
if you're going to pay cash over the period of someone's working lifetime, it makes sense to actually fund for other benefits that are service-based over the same period. Paying right at the end actually isn't very good in terms of cash flow management for employers. It um, doesn't achieve stability of funding either. So there are a few reasons why the existing regime on a global context is unacceptable. And indeed, when we look at a global stage, you can see that a lot of other areas of the world have started making this change as well. The UK, NEST 2013, that came in. It's now got the best part of over 4 million employees enrolled into it. Australia, superannuation, over 2 million. Um, Malaysia, best part of 6 million. Hong Kong, over 3 million. The rest of the world is moving towards a funded, protected, defined contribution stage. It makes sense for the Middle East to actually move as well. And we know that this isn't just, it's not just the DIFC who have been openly considering this kind of move. Two months ago, there was a conference under the patronage of the Federal Authority for Human Resources looking at exactly the reformation of the onshore labour law in this regard. So this is being spoken about, not just here, but onshore, as well as other Middle Eastern countries as well. So against this global trend, it's worth just having a, a quick recap of what the working group came up with in terms of its uh, conclusions. As Jacques mentioned, there were three main reports. The first report, the main finding was that reform of the existing end of service gratuity should be considered. The second uh, phased report came up with some high level recommendations, which you can see along the top line there, which were basically that the new replacement, if uh, to be considered, should be of a defined contribution design. What does defined contribution actually mean, just in case there are any people in the audience who may be a little unsure? Defined benefits is a formula. So the benefit that you get is typically based on your years of service and your salary when you leave. Defined contribution is where contributions are paid based on your salary as you progress through employment. Those are contributions are invested on your behalf elsewhere and when you leave, you get the value of those invested contributions paid back as a lump sum. So it's a different kind of benefit. The third stage of uh, the working group's um, work was to actually try and get some, some actual detail on the design of what uh, a global best practice defined contribution arrangement might look like. And I'm afraid there's a lot of words there, and some of you at the back might not be able to see it, so I do apologise. Uh, but it was important to try and get the main features up there. When you look around the globe, the way in which you try and set up an arrangement that is independent of, the trust of uh, an employer's finances and provides an excellent investment vehicle for employees' money is a trust vehicle. It's a separate legal entity. Uh, overseen by a trustee. And, and this is globally the best option that we've seen currently. When it comes to benefits and contributions, we're aware that what we're considering here is reforming what we see as the um, disadvantages of the existing end of service gratuity, i.e. its defined benefit, and largely there's no requirement to fund. So what we want is a defined contribution basis that is protected and funded. We're not seeking to try and change the level of benefits or costs or anything like that. So on that basis, the proposal that the working group came up with was to say, well, you can actually work, so you can actually see what the rate of accrual of benefit under the existing end of service gratuity is. It's 70% of one month for every year of service under five years and a full month for every year after five years. So that equates to an accrual rate of 5.83% for the first five years, 8.33% after five years. So on a cost neutral basis, contributions would be set equal to this. And I would emphasize cost neutral. Transition, this is always a very important aspect of any change because most employees will turn around and say, but what about, what, what about my existing benefits? What the proposal is, is there's no change. What you have earned 
will remain as it is on the same benefit formula. So at the date of change, if you have earned 10 years of service, you will still get a benefit based on those 10 years of service. It will be based not on the salary at the date of change, but under the existing formula where it is based on the salary when you eventually leave. So your accrued benefit is exactly the same. The only change is that after the transition date, instead of earning more service, contributions become payable to the new trust vehicle. The trustees oversee the governance of this vehicle. Day-to-day -day operations are run by an administrator. Both of these positions um, are typically provided by third-party service providers and in good fashion it makes sense to hold a competitive tendering process uh, for available uh, vendors to be able to pitch and provide best possible value. And again, that's what you see around the globe as well. In terms of investment options, um, the majority of people will generally have two questions. The first one is, what's everyone else doing? And the second one is, where do I sign? But we're keen to make sure that people do take control of how much they invest. So there'll be, the first option is a default option where if an employee is unwilling or unable to make a choice, the trustee will make a sensible choice on their behalf. For those who have an idea as to what their risk appetite might be, then they can decide whether or not they would like to choose a, a balanced portfolio or a cautious portfolio or an aggressive portfolio. For those who wish to actually take even greater control, they can actually set their asset allocation, i.e. what proportion of my contributions are invested in equities or bonds or real estate and so forth. The idea is to give sufficient control because at that level, at the asset allocation, that determines 90% of the return that you'll tend to see. And that's what studies have shown. Charges. This is an important one. Global best practice, what you see around the globe is that charges are typically leveled as an annual management charge based on invested assets. What this means is that the employer is not paying for this fund. This is met through an annual management charge on invested assets and that is a typical approach taken throughout the globe. And by conducting a competitive tendering process, you can typically get very good rates of annual management charge coming through. So those are the recommendations from the, th the working group, and you can see how they've developed from, yes, consider change, actually high level, and then down to detail. So in terms of all those details, what might this look like in terms of its legal and its operational structure? Apologies if you thought the writing was tiny on the previous slides, it's even tinier here. To introduce this new vehicle, you would need overarching legislation around labour law and also to introduce the trust vehicle itself. And indeed, as Jack mentioned, in barristers from uh, London and indeed Australia have been engaged to actually advise on what this might mean. Oversight would be provided from a supervisory board from a commercial side, from DIFC, to make sure that the commercials are being met with DFSA uh, regulation of the actual service providers to make sure that they're fulfilling their requirements as well. The actual vehicle itself, the day-to-day -day operations are run by the administrator. So the administrator would directly engage with all employers around transfer of data, payments of contribution, investment and allocation of the monies to various fund managers, and finally, the payment of benefits directly to employees. So you can see the way in which the powers and the money and the information flow through this structure. The important point is, first of all, this is separate. The money is kept separate from the employer's balance sheet. So that provides benefit stability and protection. From the employer's point of view, once they have paid the contribution, they have no further obligation. They have actually met their, they've fulfilled their contribution obligation. And as you can see, and as Jacques mentioned, this is the culmination of three years of work from barristers and the working group comprised of various industry practitioners with over 25 years of experience uh, for each of them. Um, so a lot of hard work has gone into this to try and come up with something which meets and balances the, the needs of each of the communities that exist within DIFC. In terms of next steps, that could be proposed. 
So based on the feedback that we received during this meeting, uh, we would issue a summary of survey responses and so forth. Um, considering that, then there'd be a move towards moving towards implementing the legal framework and executing the trust documentation. Appointments of the administrator and trustee role, who would then start to engage with employers in time for a go live date of the 1st of January 2020. It's an ambitious, ambitious uh, timeline, but we believe achievable. Perfect. No doubt there'll be lots of questions for the Q&A session. Allow me to pass over now to Dr. Christopher Payne, who will go through the survey results. Thank you. Thank you.